Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NWS Climate Services Seminar Series. John Gottschalk at NSEP's Climate Prediction Center, CPC, he's recently been named the Acting Chief of the Operations Branch. Prior to this, John served as CPC's Head of Forecast Operations, where he was responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day routine production and dissemination of CPC's operational forecast products. He also served as the MJO operational lead at CPC and was responsible for leading the team in areas of monitoring, assessing, and predicting the MJO and its associated impacts. So you can see by this intro already that John is very well qualified to be our presenter today on the subject of the MJO. Uh, John received both a BS and an MS degree in meteorology from Penn State University in 1994 and 1996, respectively. After graduation, he was employed at the University of Miami, Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science from 1997 to 2001. In this capacity, he worked in the area of boundary layer meteorology, cloud remote sensing, MJO research, and was the university forecast meteorologist and tropical cyclone spokesman. During the period from 2001 to 2004, John was employed at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, where he worked in the area of land-atmosphere interaction. And now, without further ado, I am going to turn the presentership over to John. OK, I thank you very much, uh, Judy. I appreciate the introduction. Um, as Judy mentioned, uh, my name is John Gottschalk, and I uh, affiliate with the Climate Prediction Center. And today I'm going to be talking about the MJO, and the title is there. Um, I have a relatively limited amount of time. The presentation will be about maybe towards 50 minutes or so. But I want to try and hit all the main points, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end. And I'll be talking about the MJO and its impacts on climate and weather uh, in both the tropics and, and the mid-latitudes. So I'm going to outline what I'm going to be talking about today in a series of questions, actually, is that um, since I know not everyone may be on the same page with regard to their uh, understanding of the MGO, I do feel it's important to spend at least a few uh, minutes on what the MGO is, um, its characteristics, uh, structure, and dynamics, and also how we monitor the MGO and assess its strength. Um, most of the talk will be on impacts associated with the MGO, first in the tropics, and then later the extratropics. And then I'll wrap up with where we are currently at from a skill point of view uh, with MGO prediction and what forecast tools are available, and then what assessments CPC produces that may help those who are more interested in learning more about this and staying in tune with the MGO. So uh, first, part one, the characteristics and structure. Uh, I'm going to show an animation uh, shortly that will make some of these, this text here a little more clear, but I wanted to give some basic information first. Uh, first, the MJO is an interseasonal phenomenon or interseasonal wave that originates in the tropics, meaning uh, the variability is encompassed within a season or 90-day period. Um, the MJO results in many changes to atmospheric and oceanic variables. Uh, some of those are listed there. Um, but what makes the MJO uh, unique and also challenging is the MJO has an uh, interseasonal period of approximately, typically, 30 to 60 days. It also acts on a very large global spatial scale, and it moves. So the propagation is coherently in one direction eastwardly, um, faster in the eastern hemisphere, sorry, slower in the eastern hemisphere as compared to the western hemisphere. Um, so these sort of characteristics make it pretty, uh, pretty difficult to, to assess at times and also to uh, predict. What's shown here on this slide, and hopefully it's coming across on the GoTo uh, webinar fast enough, but it is an animation from uh, courtesy of Adrian Matthews from the UK, which shows uh, rainfall anomalies filtered for the MJO. Um, the enhanced uh, rainfall regions are the blue areas. Um, the orange areas or red areas are suppressed rainfall. And this is from CMAP precipitation data. And what I want to a few things to focus from this figure as an introductory to the MJO is that you'll notice that these blobs of colors are very large. They, uh, they're on the size of uh, part, large regions of continents or entire ocean basins. Um, so we're talking about very broad scale enhanced rainfall areas. And we're not talking about something on the order of a thunderstorm or a mesoscale type system. Second thing is you'll notice these areas are moving eastward in the tropics. The blue starts in at day zero in the Indian Ocean, moves to the Western Pacific 
becomes nondescript but still evident across parts of the Western Hemisphere and then returns to the Indian Ocean by about 45 days, in this particular animation, 48 days. Behind that is a, the dry area or the suppressed convective phase of the MGO behind that area um, also shifting eastward. So it's this couplet of large-scale anomalous or departures from normal convection that uh, is the MJ that, we're t that we talk about. And if you do not have eastward propagation, you do not have an MJO. You need to have large-scale anomalies that move coherently eastward with time. And you'll notice that it takes about 45 days for this oscillation to occur. Now, taking a look at the structure of the MGO uh, in relatively quick terms, uh, I'm going to use some highlighting here to help. Uh, what's shown here is a schematic from the original uh, Madden Julian paper in the early 70s. And what are shown here are different phases of the MGO. And I'm going to focus mainly on these phases here first, uh, panels G, H, and A, for example. And first, point your attention to a cartoon cloud. That's the enhanced area of convection or the enhanced phase of the MGO, similar to the blue shading that I showed in the previous slide. So this is a large-scale area of rainfall. Um, you'll notice that this area of rainfall, with time, will slowly shift eastward. Uh, again, geography down here, so Africa, Indonesia, and then South America. And so this, this eastward movement of this large area of enhanced convection uh, is the, the enhanced phase of the MGO shifting east. If you take a look at panel H, should the green arrow show the wind anomalies or the wind uh, variations associated with the MJO. Um, what we typically find is easterly anomalies ahead of the convection, westerly anomalies to the rear of the convection. And the MJO is baroclinic, so the winds uh, reverse with height. So in the upper levels, you have this reversal. And so another thing to point out as you get a little bit further down in this schematic, you'll notice these arrows um, come down like this, as indicated um, by the, the original schematic as well as the green arrow here. That's a suppressed air or large-scale sinking motion of the suppressed phase of the MGO. And this also will follow with time to the east. Uh, so this is a vertical structure along the equator of what the MGO uh, cell is. Now if you turn to um, three dimensions, um, what's shown here, um, again I'll illustrate using the uh, pen to make it more, a little bit more clear, is this is uh, three-dimensional, the uh, longitude from 30 east to 150 west, so basically Africa to the just east of the dateline in the Pacific. The lower uh, plane is 850, the upper plane is 200, and the middle level is 500 here. <clears throat> and again, this large area of cloudiness is again a very large scale schematic for the enhanced phase of the MJO. And you'll notice again with the wind field um, along the equator, we have enhanced easterlies preceding the enhanced convection and westerlies behind it. Uh, strong rising motion on a large scale scale, making conditions for rainfall favorable, and then we have the reversal in winds above. Now what makes this particular plot important is that the three dimensions with respect to latitude, meaning uh, latitude north of the equators here and south of the equator in this uh, direction. And you'll notice uh, with the MJO uh, near the center of the convection into the uh, rear, you straddle on the equator, uh, you tend to generate large scale anticyclonic gyres. Okay, both north and south of the equator in upper levels. At lower levels, you have the reverse. You have cyclonic circulation both north and south of the equator. And you have the reversal of these two uh, further out ahead of the convection in the suppressed phase. And these are important because this is the main way that the MJ redistributes mass in the atmosphere from the tropics into the mid-latitudes. And so it's very important to kind of think about this box, if you will, propagating or moving eastward in the deep tropics uh, with time from, say, the Indian Ocean uh, into the Pacific and then a little bit later on across the Western Hemisphere. So in order to, those were idealized from, from a number of different uh, papers and so on. This is actually an MGO composite uh, utilizing precipitation for all MGO events from November through March. And these are uh, rainfall from CMAP in millimeters per day. And I'll explain a little bit more what these are shortly. But these are phases of the MGO. And you can see, again, using real data, the similar evolution to the east of enhanced rainfall, which is indicated in green, uh, from the Indian Ocean to the Western Pacific, and then hot spots across parts of the Western Hemisphere, followed by the brown shades, uh, which are suppressed convection or suppressed rainfall with time. 
So moving to how we monitor the MJ with some of the data sets that we have at CPC, um, one of the most coherent indicators of the MGO is upper level uh, velocity potential. And what's shown here, um, which will take some time to load uh, for everybody, um, is an animation of 200 hectopascal velocity potential anomalies for an MGO event during spring of 2005. Uh, the green shades are areas uh, of upper level divergence, basically, and are, indicate conditions that are favorable for enhanced rainfall the opposite for the brown shades. And what I want to point out, point out is that early in the animation, the browns are mixed with the greens. It's a very incoherent pattern. But as we get into April, you'll notice half the globe becomes green shades, half the globe becomes brown shades. The colors darken, meaning the anomalies and the signal become stronger. Um, that's what we call a wave one structure in the MGO, meaning um, very large scale, planetary scale phenomena that is moving eastward with time. And I'll let this go one more time to illustrate that fact again, that in March and early April, um, the green stage shift from the maritime continent across the Western Hemisphere back into the Indian Ocean by early to mid-May, and then continuing through May. And then by June, these anomalies, or these green and brown blobs, become a little more uh, nondescript and more uh, volatile with respect to uh, how they're oriented on the particular animation. So that means the MGO has, has weakened. Another important variable is outgoing long-wave radiation anomalies, uh, which are just a proxy for deep convection. And what's shown on this slide are OLR anomalies uh, for a period from 2007 to 2009. Uh, this is a time longitude diagram, so time increases as you go down uh, to the bottom. Longitude is on the x-axis, and the red shades indicate suppressed convection. Uh, the blue shades indicate enhanced convection. And what you want to notice when you with regard to MGO, since we're trying to identify eastward propagation, we need to see uh, slanting in these diagrams, meaning as time increases as you go down, you want to see movement to the right in, in geography, which is what lines that are tilt from the upper left to the lower right indicate in this plot. For example, um, this particular beginning of this MGO activity in October of 2007, you see these blue shades shift eastward and down into the right in this particular plot, meaning the enhanced convection, which is the blue shades, has shifted from, say, the Indian Ocean or Indonesia into the Western Pacific near the dateline when we go from October to later on in November. It's followed by the suppressed phase of the MGO, these red shades shifting in the same way, followed by another cycle of the MGO with the blue shades, and then again with another suppressed phase of the MGO. So these dashed uh, solid and dashed lines indicate the interseasonal variability of the MGO. In this, in this particular case, two complete cycles of anomalies in the outgoing long wave radiation. When you see more vertical structure in the plot, like this is, where the blues are generally vertical and the, the reds are vertical, this is a signature in these plots for stationarity, very different from what we see here. And that's more related to the lower frequency ENSO signature. Very quickly with winds, I'm not going to harp on this because I showed it, but very, the black oval would be the enhanced phases of the uh, MGO. We have westerlies, the arrows here uh, behind the convection, and easterlies ahead of it. Uh, that's, this is in the lower levels. In the upper levels, I want to spend a little bit more time on again, and this is the enhanced phase, where the enhanced phase if we were looking at rainfall or LLR would, would indicate. Uh, but you'll notice very clearly north and south of the equator, Near the enhanced convection, we have these large-scale circulation gyres north of the equator and also south of the equator with cyclonic circulations out ahead of this. This large-scale um, pattern in the upper levels is very important, and we'll learn more about that a little bit later as well. But this really drives a lot of the impacts that we'll discuss uh, later. And the last thing I want to show to introduce is uh, how we monitor the MJ with various indices. There's a number of different indices. This is one we, uh, we use at CPC quite heavily that's very well established in the literature and by a number of different users. It's basically called the RMM index. Um, and I don't have time to go into the details of the math in creating this, but what I want to first focus on is the plot on the right, which shows velocity potential anomalies, again, uh, in time longitude format. So the same variable that I showed in the animation, but again, in a, in a uh, time longitude format to look for eastward propagation. And these lines that you see here dashed and dotted indicate that 
Easter propagation of enhanced phase, suppressed phase, enhanced phase, followed by another suppressed phase. And this plot on the left is for the exact same time period. So if you take a look at about April 1st in this region here, this line on down, that same, this behavior that you see here is exactly what's shown in the upper left, but in a, slightly, in a different format. Uh, what's shown here are these daily points, are the location, the center of the enhanced phase of the MJO. Each number refers to the date of the particular uh, data point, which is, for this case, April 1st. So you can see the phases are indicated around here by the numbers in the triangular areas, Indian Ocean phases 2 and 3, uh, wrapping around to the Western Pacific for phases 6 and 7, and so on. Uh, this, another thing you need to know about this is that when these lines move in a counterclockwise movement around the circle, that's a signature for eastward propagation. And the farther that these points are away from the inner circle, the stronger the MGO amplitude. And I'll demonstrate that uh, in comparing these two figures. So if you start on April 1st, um, you'll see that in the Western Hemisphere of Africa, which is what this phase refers to, uh, at zero longitude, you'll see that this area of enhanced phase of the MGO has shifted east over time so that by the time we get back towards early May, um, we're, we're very close to reaching um, this original point. But you also will notice at that time this propagation becomes nondescript. Um, some of the anomalies in the velocity potential image here on the right become more vertical, meaning we've lost the propagation and we've lost the signa signature. And so you see that this line stops and then also heads towards the circle. So what, you're, what that is indicating in these plots is a weakening MJO signal because propagation, eastward propagation has stopped and the amplitude is decreasing, meaning the points are getting closer and closer to this inner circle. So try to keep this in mind when we look at figures a little bit later on. Okay, so now moving into the impacts, uh, first in the tropics. And um, it's very important to understand the impacts in the tropics because a lot of um, these uh, realizations um, are the drivers for what we see in impacts from the MJO in the mid-latitude. So first, um, I briefly showed this slide earlier to characterize the um, MJO in general, but I do want to focus just a tad on some of the hot spots over land in the winter and in the summer with MJO phases. And keep in mind, these phases here, numbers, are what I showed uh, right here, 2, 3, and all the way around to 1. And so with uh, the MJO, uh, phase and the Indian Ocean, of course, we have enhanced rainfall of the green shades in this area, but there's other hot spots that occur over land that I'm going to focus on. East Africa, for example, over time uh, will become quite enhanced. Northern Australia and all these islands in the maritime continent into Southeast Asia. As we get a little further on in, in phase, as we get later on into the um, phase of 7, 8, and 1, you'll notice in the winter season, uh, there's a very strong influence in agriculture and other issues across South America and then comes back into the Indian Ocean. Uh, with regard to suppression, we have the, the opposite phase for these areas across East Africa, as I mentioned, and then later on, also South America uh, as well. Now, as we turn towards the boreal summer with the seasonal cycle, of course, uh, the action shifts generally north of the equator in most regions. And one thing to point out with this is that the MGO has a unique uh, tilted structure during the summertime. Uh, you'll notice this northwest to southeast tilt in the anomalies. There's considerable northward propagation in the eastern hemisphere with the MGO during the boreal summer season. And with regard closer to home with impacts, as we are in phases 3, 4, and 5, meaning when the MGO enhanced phase is in the Indian Ocean, there's a very strong dry signal across the Americas, um, Central America and the southern parts of uh, uh, North America uh, with time. And as we move forward, um, a little bit later, as the MGO enhanced phase shifts to the Western Hemisphere, of course, the Eastern Pacific ITCC becomes uh, quite enhanced. Uh, we have lots of uh, above average rainfall across much of the Americas, uh, North America, Central America, the Caribbean, as well as into the southern parts of the CONUS. And we'll talk more about impacts to the Southwest monsoon uh, in a little bit as well. Now, one of the major impacts in the tropics with the MJO is a very well-documented relationships with MJO and tropical cyclone development. Uh, what's shown here is the pioneering work by Maloney and Harbin in 2000, which shows uh, two things. On the left are wind anomalies, wind vectors, for two phases of the MJO. The westerly wind phase, which uh, is synonymous with regard to the enhanced convective phases, as I've been calling it, 
and B, the easterly wind phase, which is would be uh, consistent with the suppressed fit convective phase of the MJO, as, as I've been calling it. And on the right are, um, during this period of, of, of study, um, the eventual tropical cyclone development regions between these two phases. And you can see a very large difference between the enhanced phase on the top and the suppressed phase on the bottom. Uh, very strong link. And now this is not just for the Gulf of Mexico. This relationship has been studied with dozens of papers across all ocean basins in the global tropics, from the Indian Ocean to the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific and, of course, the, the Atlantic Basin. Uh, a nice example of the modulation of tropical cyclones by the MJO is shown here. 2008 is, is one of the poster child sort of seasons uh, for modulation of the MJO in the Atlantic Basin. And what's shown here is you'll recognize time longitude diagram for a velocity potential. Um, and again, these dashed lines and dotted lines are the representation of an eastern propagating MGO signal. And I want you to focus mainly on after mid-August or so. And what's shown here is that when this particular MGO was very active in, in uh, the summer of 2008, and we had a very good modulation uh, of activity. The MGO tends to modulate the activity on, a, on the order of a few weeks. So you have these bursts and lulls of activity typically. And this occurred uh, in 2008, where we had the enhanced, the MGO developed basically here in mid-August. Uh, in the Atlantic Basin, and we had a cluster of storms, you may recall, in that, across the basin in general, followed by the suppressed phase, which is in this yellow box. We had a period of two or three weeks where we had no activity, and then later on, in, by early October, we had another burst of four named storms in a period of a couple of weeks, and that tends to be what happens, happens when you have a pretty good, robust MJO. Uh, occurring, and then by the time we got to later October, we again we had a, had a lull. Um, now, of course, this doesn't always work out. But in this particular case, um, we had a very good link. Now, turning to the monsoons in the Southwest, specifically, um, I'll show that in a second. Um, but with, with respect to the monsoon systems in general, uh, the MGO modulates um, the monsoon circulations in, in a few ways. One, of course, is um, the MGO periods, whether it be the enhanced phase and suppressed phase, can very much affect monsoon onset and also its end, end dates. And of course, the intensity of those onsets and, and demises of the monsoon. The MGO often leads to breaks in the monsoon or periods of especially enhanced activity, depending on what phase. And one thing to note is that the monsoon areas outside the U.S. are typically more impacted. For example, uh, the Indian monsoon, the Australian monsoon, and uh, the African monsoon. But there is a uh, clear links to the, for the U.S. in the Western region uh, with regard to the MJO. What's shown here is an example um, of OLR anomalies. Again, this is a proxy for uh, deep tropical rainfall. And these are departures from normal from a period in June, July of uh, 2008. And what's shown here first is you'll notice uh, when we had uh, MJO, take my word for it, during this time we had an MJO, as I showed in the previous slide, and the East Pacific ITC, which is typical, becomes quite enhanced. And very often, we'll get a number of tropical cyclones that develop in the Eastern Pacific and track uh, west, northwest into this region. And this is what happened in this particular period. There was actually three tropical cyclones that developed. And very often, um, when this happens, whether it be strong easterly waves or, or tropical, more developed tropical systems, sometimes they can lead to Gulf of California moisture surges into the southwest. And this is one way the MGO seems to modulate some of the periods of activity during the monsoon is if we have tropical cyclone development. Uh, certainly, moisture in the eastern Pacific that's enhanced from the MGO can eventually work its way into the southwest, whether there's a M, um, MGO, or, I'm sorry, whether there's a tropical cyclone act activity or not. Um, but this is one indirect way that seems to happen at times and has to be, it was one thing to keep an eye on two or three weeks in advance. With respect to ENSO now, um, there's a lot of literature that has shown that the MGO can impact the intensity, timing, and duration of ENSO events. Um, what's important to know, though, is there's, there's different time scales for these interactions, and they occur both at the surface and at depth in the ocean. Um, what's shown here um, are links to the surface impact, which when the MGO, as I, I showed earlier, the MGO will modulate low-level wind anomalies uh, 
pretty strongly associated with various phases of the MGO. And this impacts the surface uh, sea ocean temperatures or the sea surface temperatures across the Pacific. And what's shown here is two particular time series of Nino 4 and Nino 3.4, which represent these two boxes here on the right along the equatorial Pacific. And this is for an El Nino event during the 2004-2005 season. And what you'll notice is this nice oscillation of uh, changes over top of the overall ENSO warming trend or El Nino uh, pattern that we had developing during that fall and winter season. And this, these variations are directly linked to the MGO through um, uh, evaporation changes, uh, surface flux changes associated with uh, increased winds, uh, upwelling of, of deeper water, as well as uh, decreasing and increasing solar insulation. And you'll notice that each one of these peaks is about 45 days on average during this particular time. And this, was, this modulation was entirely due to the MJO, despite an increased trend in the ENSO or El Nino intensity with respect to this region, these two regions. It's more strongly in Nino 4 because it's further west. Uh, but you'll notice that these impacts or these changes in temperature are not trivial. They're on the order of 0.3 to 0.5 degrees. And I mention it only because sometimes it can be easily to be um, to equate changes in the ENSO state with variations that, see, that we see from the interseasonal associated with the MJO. This is more of a shorter term impact. Now at depth is different. Uh, the MJO can impact changes in the ENSO cycle um, if we have a number of MJO events in succession. There, there's more, this is still an open research issue, um, but there is some indications that there may be a slight tilt depending on MJO activity over, integrated over a longer period. And what happens with the MGO is that you can increase the low-level easterlies. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, you can decrease the low-level easterlies or trade winds when you have the enhanced phase come out into the western Pacific. And what that, ha what that does is it lifts up the sea surface height and therefore uh, produces what's called an oceanic downwelling Kelvin wave. And what's shown here is kind of an example of how that mechanism works, where you have warmer water initially in the western Pacific, but with an oceanic Kelvin wave, you tend to slosh that warmer water from the western Pacific across the central Pacific towards the eastern Pacific, and eventually that water can, warmer water can make its way to the surface. And if you have enough of these events over a long enough time period, uh, some studies have shown that you can modulate uh, the timing of any ENSO uh, phase development as well as uh, ending an event. So, but again, this is still a research issue. Okay, now I'm going to turn to um, MJ impacts in the exotropics now. And um, to start that discussion, uh, what's shown here are a number of theoretical as well as observational study-based uh, images which show the well-known impact of how tropical heating, um, enhanced rainfall, enhanced convection in the deep equatorial uh, regions of the tropics can mod modulate the mid-latitude and higher-latitude circulation. With, for example, this is a theoretical study that showed um, if the enhanced phase of the MGO were to shift into this region, uh, the maritime continent, for example, you're going to get large-scale uh, tropical rainfall, diabatic heating, and hence upper-level divergence that will release uh, what develop what's called a Rosby wave train structure, uh, which is very similar to ENSO. This can occur on multiple time scales. This can also happen, happen with the MGO on, on the shorter time scale where you have this arcing pattern of upper-level positive heights, uh, uh, negative heights, and so on, all the way from the Western Pacific Maritime Continent region down towards North America. This is a well-known impact for ENSO and also the MJO. And observationally, this is also shown here where you have anomalous ridging associated uh, in the deep tropics, as I mentioned in previous slides, with enhanced convection, which would be indicated through here. And then you have this pattern downstream. And this pattern downstream is very, very important because it modulates, of course, the mid-latitude uh, synoptic patterns. Mm. And to provide some additional context for this is that, as I mentioned, these teleconnections, some of the largest are across the Pacific North American sector. They change the mid-latitude circulation in a way very similar to ENSO, uh, but it's important to note that the time scale, these are on the order of a few weeks, as opposed to acting um, or being evident as an average over a season. Um, like ENSO, unfortunately, the MJO's strongest teleconnection uh, is also limited mainly towards the winter months, late autumn, winter, and early spring. Um, what makes 
things particularly challenging is that the MGO tends to occur in a different background synoptic pattern, of course. Um, different seasons have different impacts, and en different ENSO states also affect the eventual tangible impacts uh, from a weather forecasting and climate forecasting perspective in, in the extratropics. These impacts can vary considerably from event to event. And two other quick notes, these, these Rosby wave dispersions or wave trains uh, can enhance or dampen ongoing circulation patterns, and this, this forcing also moves eastward with the MGO um, as well. So when I'm, the approach I'm going to take to this um, discussion uh, in extratropics is the first to describe physically some of the impacts that we see and how they link to some of the more climate teleconnection type patterns. And then I'll scale down to show composites of heights, temperature, and precipitation as examples to show how um, what some of the actual specific sensible weather impacts are. So to that end, what I want to show here is 200 hectopascal height anomalies. There's an 11-day running mean on this. And this is for an event from later 2008 into 2009, which shows um, heights Departures from normal in the shading, positive heights indicated in red, negative heights indicated in blue, and the total is shown in the contours. And what I want you to focus on first is that during the late December, early January period, um, we had um, the clustering of the solid black lines or contours or more back across East Asia, uh, indicating our retracted jet. Um, as we move um, later on into the Early to mid parts of January, you'll notice these contours develop in the Western Pacific. Those contours are showing that are indicative of the heating, tropical heating associated with the enhanced phase of the MGO as it shifted east. And with that occurring, very often we'll get um, Pacific East Asian Pacific jet extensions. You can notice that here later on in January, where uh, once that heating has occurred in the purple boxes, we start to see this extension out towards the Dateline and to the east, and that has very strong impacts across um, the Pacific. North American region where we built a ridge across uh, the west coast and a very amplified trough across parts of, of the east. Also notice uh, we had a flip in, in the sign of the polar anomalies um, would be consistent with AO phase, meaning from a positive phase in blue with the blue shades to negative by the time the end of the animation on over the 30-day period across the more polar areas, which is something I'll touch on uh, shortly. Now, um, a colleague here at CPC, Michelle LaRue, did an analysis for the 2007-2008 event, and I like to show it because it really, really kind of encapsulates um, how, these, how the MGO can really modify a seasonal uh, forecast in general. And what she did was she took uh, a period where there was a lot of MGO activity during this uh, fall, winter season uh, during a La Nina. And the seasonal average of the height anomalies is shown in the upper right. And you can see the positive heights here, the ridging, very classic La Nina pattern, meaning a retracted jet, um, more blocking and less uh, flow across the Pacific, and with the, also the other typical La Nina impacts further downstream. But what she also did is she grouped the days in which there were jet extensions and when there were not, and grouped those by MGO phase, which is what's shown here on the left. And uh, it was a very good correspondence to when, when the MJO is in phases uh, 2, 3, 4, and 5, meaning the convection is back across the Indian Ocean and Indonesia, we had much more retracted jet days, which produced a pattern of temperatures uh, like this that's shown in the middle right. And the extension jet days, uh, much more were grouped by phases 7, 8, 1, and 2 of the MJO and resulted in this pattern. So this is the typical sort of variability that we're trying to do a better job of, of representing in our forecast, longer term forecast at CPC, uh, tied, to, tied to the MJO. One other uh, interesting impact that's becoming increasingly relevant or uh, noted in the literature over the last few years is the impact of the MJO on typical and standard higher latitude climate modes of variability, in this particular case, the North Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, what's shown here is a study from Lynn et al. in 2009, and uh, what this does is it shows the, the lead lag relationship between the MJO phase and eventually the sign of the NAO index. And what's shown here um, is MJO phase is 1 through 8, again, similar to the MJO index I showed before. And I only want you to focus on um, the areas below um, lag zero through here, just for simplicity. And what this means is lag one, two, three, four, this should say five, is the um, pentad lag um, 
from this MJO phase point. So lag zero will be in, would be instantaneous. And what the point here is that when the MJO is in phases two and three, uh, over the next 15, 10 to 20 days or so, there's a tendency for the NAO phase to become positive um, by lag zero. And the opposite is statistically significantly found to occur when the MJO is in phases six, seven, uh, for example, meaning the Western Pacific, there's a tendency on the order of 10 to 20 days into the future where the NAO sign will flip from where it is then, whether it be neutral or positive, to a negative NAO. And so a number of studies have collaborated with this sort of um, uh, work or initial studies. And one of those is done by colleagues here at CPC. Uh, most um, Emily Riddle's paper in Climate Dynamics in 2012 captures this. Um, what they did was they took a completely different approach and found very similar results, which is encouraging. And what they found, what they did is they, they clustered 500 hectopascal geopotential height anomalies uh, for December through March periods over for uh, 20, from 1979 to 2010 and grouped these into clusters using, using cluster analysis. And they found seven main patterns, two of which are shown here. And so what this indicates is that during MJOs, there's certain preferred patterns that seem to emerge. And what I'm going to focus on is the one on the right, uh, but there is other ones, um, and you can take a look at the paper to get more details on that. But one of the most prevalent ones is this negative, this negative AO, NAO pattern that I was referring to before, for example. Very clear, classic NAO pattern here, negative NAO pattern. And what they, what they did was they found that the orange bars, for example, here are the percent frequency of the pattern that's shown, meaning this pattern, is above climatology, and the green is when the percent frequency of the pattern is less than climatology. And where they're shaded in is where they're statistically significant. And so if you take a look, again, similar to what I showed in the previous slide, when we're in phases uh, five, six, and seven, there's this tendency for increased frequency or probability by the time we get to day zero, which is what this x-axis is, for this pattern to have materialized meaning we have switched to this negative NAO pattern. Now turning to um, some analysis from straight composites for heights, and then I'll show temperature and precip shortly. Um, I wanted to show this because these are uh, composites for the winter season for 300 hectopascal height and winds for the eight phases. And I just wanted to highlight some of the most robust signatures that we tend to uh, materialize with the MJO. And what's shown uh, here for starting in phases, phase three, is this very classical wave train sort of pattern where we have a, a ridging across the central Pacific, okay? One of the most impacts beyond that is, which is very robust, is the Western Atlantic, Eastern U.S. positive heights are ridging that tends to, to develop in phases five, six, and, and sometimes uh, straddling four and seven is this sort of time period here. As we get later on, some of the largest impacts are an extension of the jet, as I mentioned before, for seven, phases seven and eight, where we have a cyclonic circulation that develops in the central Pacific. And then later on in phases one and two, uh, one of the strongest impacts is uh, consistent with very strong subtropical jets across the southern part of uh, the weather service forecast region, southern region and southern uh, western region. On CPC's website, we have a number of temperature and precipitation composites. I don't have time, of course, to go through all the seasons. I just, I just wanted to note that we have these for every three-month overlapping season, um, for both temperature and precipitation. Uh, what's shown here on the left is for uh, November, December, and January for the eight phases of the MJ index I described earlier. These are anomalies. Um, positive, uh, red for temp positive is red, blue uh, is negative. What's shown on the right, that which is equally as important, is the significance. And these plots are maybe somewhat counterintuitive in that the purple shading and the dark blue is what you want to focus on, which are the um, areas in which we see 95% or greater statistical significance. So those are the areas you want to focus on. And so I'm showing two plots. I'm showing uh, late fall, early winter temperature, where the signals are most um, spatially consistent and strong and robust. And then I'll show next late spring, early summer precipitation composites, which are on the lower end of things, very noisy, uh, low significance, and low anomalies. So first, focusing here, you'll notice that as we get during the fall and winter, there's a very strong positive temperature anomaly, as I mentioned, across much of the conus. And then it's the events that occur, the periods when the MJO is in phases 
seven, eight, and one is when we start to get these cold air outbreaks. Again, tending to uh, be consistent with the flipping of NAO and AO to the negative, negative side of things. We also tend to see in phase two amplifying troughs that dig down across the west and very often um, result in cold temperatures as indicated by the statistically significant signal in that region. Now as we turn to the precipitation during May, June, and July, you can see much more, uh, first focusing on the significance, you see much more in the way of yellow, orange, and red areas, more spotty areas of blue. Um, and those blue areas typically reside in areas where there's very weak anomalies, and so the, the impact is very weak to begin with. And so during the summer months, um, during the late spring and summer months, the MGU impacts uh, are very limited, and any teleconnection from the uh, tropics into the mid-latitudes needs to be taken with great care. Uh, during later on in the summer and into early fall, there is more of a precipitation signal across parts of the southern tier with tropical cyclones and so on. Uh, but this is kind of the lower end during this particular period. Another thing that we use at CPC, uh, colleagues at, uh, at CPC Steve Baxter put together lag composites. Uh, this is another way of looking at things which, are, which is also very helpful. Uh, what's shown on the left is, what's shown in both of these plots is 200 hectopascal um, height anomalies positive heights in red, negative heights in blue. And what's shown here is the instantaneous phase for the Western Indian Ocean, so when the convection is in this region. Um, and what's shown each subsequent row is five-day lags into the future uh, through a composite for the MJO events. And so this is kind of a, a simple forecast tool for circulation. And what you'll notice is that in coming time with the convection in the Indian Ocean, we, we tend to build up ridging here across Asia uh, over time. And we tend to eventually get higher heights across much of the east, again, indicating that warmer signature uh, that I showed on previous slides. On the right is a companion plot for the Western Pacific, which shows the opposite, where you have uh, the slow development of a large-scale cyclonic uh, anomaly at the North Pacific, and positive to the south, indicating an extended jet, and a positive heights across parts of the northern uh, latitudes of North America. So kind of in a quick summary before I wrap this up with a, a few, five or six more slides, is the, uh, from a forecaster perspective. Um, the MJO should be used right now to improve your situational awareness. Now we're, we're, we're working on ways to better quantify the information that we're learning and using into our forecasts, both in the extended range and also moving into the week's uh, three, four uh, time range. Um, but the MJO can, is very useful for identifying upcoming potential pattern changes. Uh, evaluating uh, model forecasts and weighting these forecasts when model forecast spread is large, um, and also to enhance our odds of additional lead time for uh, potential extreme events that are consistent with the MGO phase. And at CPC, uh, when we have model forecast spread that's large, um, we like to see our weight models in which the the forcing or the circulation we're seeing in the mid-latitudes is most consistent with what we're seeing in the tropics uh, when we have a stronger MJO if there's large model spread. So these are some of the things that may help. Uh, and also tidbit to note is that when the MJO events move more slowly, meaning the period is longer, closer to the 60-day or longer uh, period to move around the tropics, the teleconnection tends to be stronger and also for multiple loops and subsequent loops because the uh, climate has been more preconditioned um, for the interseasonal variability that we're seeing in the tropics. So the last thing I want to show um, very quickly is the overview where we are with prediction. Um, overall, the MJO is predictable, and I'm talking about the tropical indices of the MJO, on the order of about two to three weeks, depending on the method. Uh, a lot of the skill and statistical techniques comes from established events, um, and transitions are still not captured well at all. Um, it's only been recently that the MJO uh, dynamical predictions have reached or surpassed the statistical predictions, and I mean over the last five or six years. Uh, one of the activities that we have at CPC that's been helpful over the last few years has been the application of the Wheeler-Hendon RMM index methodology to ensemble, more, ensemble forecast data. And that's what we've done here for a number of different modeling systems. And, um, You'll recognize these similar sort of phase plots where the dots here, are the, the horizontal, I'm sorry, the solid lines are the uh, MJ observation points. Um, the yellow lines are the ensemble numbers from the GFS in this case and the Canadian on the right in this example. The ensemble mean is the green line, uh, thick line for week one and the thinner line for week two. 
Uh, the gray shading indicates some measure of spread in the forecast, meaning that 90% of the members are in the light gray shading and 50% are in the dark gray shading. And so you can gather inf information from the models, different modeling systems internationally uh, for the ensemble spread, propagation speed, and the amplitude. And this has helped us um, get better better assessment to the future of where the MGO state's going. Um, so these model forecasts, or we're working on uh, basically studies right now to evaluate how these models do. I don't have time to show all of these plots, but this is all, all these lines. But basically, the lead time is from day one down to 32, an anomaly by very correlation on the left. And in a nutshell, um, the European and UK Met Office models tend to have the highest skill. Those are up in this sort of range. Um, the GFS is the orange, the operational GFS is the orange line, which has useful skill. Again, 0.5 anomaly correlation of about 12 days. The ensemble GFS on the order of 14 to 15 days, and the bias corrected data from the GFS on the order of probably about 16 days. The European longer range forecasts, which are these two lines, um, have uh, tremendous skill. Um, they're on the order of about two, th uh, three to as much as four weeks, depending on the situation. Uh, the CFS is quite good also. It's much, much improved from the version one. Uh, it's on, out to about 20 days on average during this four-year period, which is what's shown here from 2008 or so to through most of 2012. We're also in the process of evaluating by MJO phase, and I don't want to go through all the details here other than to say that there's certain models that do better um, in certain phases uh, than others, and so we're working on a multi-model ensemble of this information to help us uh, produce a, a better forecast of the tropical convection uh, on weeks two and, and eventually th uh, three and four. And to wrap up some of the assessments that we have at CPC that may help, uh, for those who are interested in learning more and staying in tune with the MGO, the CPC's MGO weekly update, which is updated once per week by the end of the day on Monday. And it's a short uh, collection of monitoring and prediction products to uh, basically provide an assessment of where we're at with the MGO, what phase it's in, what strength it is in, and how we expect it to evolve over the next couple of weeks, um, and what the impacts may be both in the tropics and in the U.S. And the, the assessment really boils down to an overview slide which uh, tries to, in short term, try to assess um, what we would want the field to at least understand about the MGO in the sense of the com next coming weeks or so. We also apply this information as part of the Global Tropics Hazards and Benefits Outlook that's produced on release Tuesday afternoon each week as well. Uh, this stemmed out of the MJO forecast themselves, but includes other information, including background ENSO, as well as other modes of variability in the deep tropics. Uh, and also in, 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 in targets areas of enhanced rainfall on a large scale and suppressed rainfall with the idea that we're trying to make an assessment of where the large scale convection will evolve and therefore not only produce uh, an assessment for the tropics, but also where the circulation may change in weeks two, three, and four in the future. Um, tropical cyclone potential is also highlighted on here because of the link between the MGO and tropical cyclone uh, development. Along with that briefing, there's a, uh, along with that product, uh, on Tuesdays at 11.30, there's a briefing that's done by CPC um, that reviews the tropical conditions, describes the major climate modes and what the impacts will be both in the tropics and the U.S. It's about 15 minutes or so, and, and it provides an opportunity for the field to ask any questions about um, the MGO status, where we're going, and what impacts there might be. So I, if you're interested in joining this, uh, send me an email. I'll be very happy to add you to the list, um, and we would appreciate any feedback from this product as well. And so that's all I have. There's some information sources that are listed here, and I will wrap up there. Um, and I wanted to thank everyone. Uh, thanks CSD for inviting me and also for everyone's attention online. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, John. Um, we did receive a couple of questions and some more coming in right now. Uh, we have two questions from Brett Lutz. I'll give you the first one first. Will the lag component, uh, excuse me, will the lag composites be available on your website in the future, or will there be a paper published that has these composites? Yeah, very good question. We're working on a paper now, and that's the reason why they're not on the website yet. Uh, once that paper is uh, completed and, and goes through a re review and is accepted, uh, those plots will be made available on our website. Um, I don't have a 
clear timeline yet on that. Um, I can talk to Steve, who's responsible for, for that, um, and get an update, and I can send Brett an email on that. It's probably going to be on the order of probably um, a year, though, by the time we get through that entire process. Okay, one more question from Brett. Let's also, do the forecasters making the 6 to 14 day products integrate the NJO into their forecast process on a regular basis? That's a very good question. We, we certainly do. Um, certain forecasters are more, um, are more um, in tune or more, feel more confident, maybe the better way of saying, of trying to work the MGO into their forecast. I've been a bit, very big advocate and been pushing to that, pushing for that over the last few years, and I think we've made a lot of in, in strides in that um, with some of the forecasters. But some of the uh, forecasters have been more reluctant. So, we to answer the question. We, we definitely do regularly. It depends on the strength of the uh, MJO, of course, and also depends very much on the season. Um, these impacts become um, there's a narrow window for where some of these impacts have the, um, are mo most likely to. The, the tropical convection is to impact the mid-latitudes. And again, that's mainly during the winter and early spring. And things drop off very quickly as you get into April and, in, and into May. And they sometimes can drag on getting into the winter in October and November. And so there's a l relatively limited window. So we are cautious and conservative about it. But we are definitely due when we feel it's appropriate. A comment and a question from Todd Morris. He said, excellent presentation. Will you make these slides available for later review? If so, where? I can respond to Todd and tell you that the recording will be available on our website. But I think he's also referring to either a PDF or a PowerPoint. Yeah, I, I can, I'll be happy to send this. Uh, I'll create a PDF or send a PowerPoint or, or both to you, Judy. And you can, um, you can send us to Todd or, or post them. All right, and that would be on the website uh, that we have. And Todd, I can send you that link if you need it, or anyone else, too. But it's basically where we have our schedule for the NWS Climate Services Seminar Series. OK, a question from David Reynolds. How important is it to differentiate the components of the RMM to determine the strength of the, of the convective anomaly versus other components? There are good websites that show these component strengths. Wheeler diagram can show strong MJO, but there can be little anomalous convection. Very, very good question, and, and we agree with, with Dave's comment. Uh, at CPC, we don't um, use the RMM index per se in the sense of making our official assessment. We look at uh, many, many different factors. The RMM index is just, just one index, and in fact, um, the OLR signature or com component of the three variable index, the RMM index, is actually quite low. Uh, it's on average of only about 15 to 20 percent, if not if that. And so what we use is we use other indices. For example, there's the CPC MJ index on our website also, which is velocity potential, which gets at one of the main factors in changing the circulation uh, for the US and the Pacific uh, because of the tropical heating associated with that. And so we, we make use of not only the Wheeler index, the, the RMM index, but also other indices. And when we see a consistent solution or a consistent message uh, is when we try to um, um, push the gun, if you will, or shoot the gun in the sense of making more confidence or having more confidence in impacts. And so for all the models that I show on, on the website for the different modeling systems, I plan to break up the components or the percentages also of OLR, U850, and U200 as well. So basically, to answer his question is that we just don't use the uh, RMM index itself. Uh, we use a lot of factors, and we make sure we look, see a response, meaning the in convection, before we really say much with regard to, to any teleconnection. OK, a question from Gary Austin. Given the eastward movement, let me read that again, because I think I slurred a little bit. Given the eastward movement of the MJO, what is the physical significance of analyzing the cyclonic circulations to the east of the MJO? The, one of the significant areas for that, um, similar to ENSO um, in general, is that these cyclonic circulations in the upper levels 
um, very much can increase, for example, uh, wind shear downstream and suppress activity. That's one of the main mechanisms for why uh, the suppressed phase of the MGO results in typical lulls in tropical cyclone activity. And so if, if I, showed, I showed earlier one of the, the uh, upper level height um, three-dimensional schematic. During the suppressed phase, you see these cyclonic circulations uh, to the uh, north and south of the equator near the dateline. And those can produce uh, increasing shear across the eastern Pacific, for example, uh, decreasing uh, hurricane activity. The corresponding upper-level anticyclonic gyres behind it, though, can actually build ridges and vent convection and actually increase tropical cyclone activity. And so the, these gyres in the upper levels, whether it be anticyclonic or cyclonic, are really important um, in many ways. And one of those is basically, uh, one example of those is the tropical cyclone impact. Now, at the lower levels, at 850, for example, the cyclonic circulations um, near the surface, near and to the rear of the convection, is very important because those cyclonic circulations there, and to, to carry on with the tropical cyclone example, um, make, uh, make disturbances. They're very efficient at generating cyclonic vorticity, of course. And so those disturbances that are in that area um, may have more, are more robust, and they have a better chance of developing in the tropical cyclones. And there's, there's other impacts. but I think that's kind of a good example, or one of the best examples, of how these upper level and lower level gyre circulation, um, anomalous circulation centers really play a strong role in impacts. And I like to use that example. OK. I received a request from Todd Morris and also from Richard Heim to have the web link sent to them. If any of the rest of you all would like to get to uh, receive that web link, which would include the recording, and it will also have the posted PowerPoint or PDF of John's presentation today. Just go ahead and fill in in your question block and just say, please link. And uh, I'll make a note of it, and I will send an email to you with that link in it. Um, one comment from Brett Lutz, and it says, thanks. Excellent updates and review. And I'm going to give another minute or two, maybe not even that long. I'm getting a couple more requests for the link. Um, my thanks and all of the thanks from the 45 people who participated in our webinar today, and thanks to them also, but very much thank you, John, for participating in our program and making a wonderful presentation today. Thank you very much. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you.